Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's video on how I would write Lost as part one, season one. Uh, so this video I will talk about uh, if I were doing Lost, how I would have wrote it. Uh, and this is a series of videos. This isn't going to be a standalone video. It's not just about season one. I'm actually just talking about the entire six seasons of the show. However, this video will only focus on season one. But part two, when I talk about season two, will continue from this video. Uh, so basically you need to watch them in order to get what I'm doing because uh, things will be a bit different from how the show will do it. It will sort of spiral, be the butterfly effect, so to speak, uh, with the changes that I make. So each video will be building off of the other video. So one thing I want to acknowledge up front and be completely honest about that this video, this series of videos is absolutely Monday morning quarterbacking. I will be completely upfront about that. So this isn't necessarily like calling out the writers for bad writing or anything like that because I know a lot of the issues with the show or the issues I have to do, had to do with production issues like studio interference, them not knowing what uh, to do, actors uh, dropping out and stuff like that. And plus, as I say a lot, this was made back in 2000 for during the 2000s where doing serialized television like this was not as commonplace uh, it was not as uh, you know common so they weren't really sure how to do it and so they were kind of still doing the old TV show format which kind of didn't work with what they wanted to do here whereas in modern times they got this format down pat so what I'm gonna say here is not necessarily what I think they should have done back in the 2000s but what I'm going to say is what I think should be done if the show is ever rebooted. So if they ever reboot Lost, uh, how would it go? And this is, I'm going to give uh, my opinion of how I would do a reboot of Lost, basically. And basically I think Lost should be rebooted because of the fact that it was it was so such a great show and had so many great ideas but it was held back by uh, a lot of production circumstances like the decade it was in wasn't used to it the network it was on uh, wasn't really conductive to telling this kind of story and there was a lot of outside pressures and stuff which is why I think it should be reviewed because I think you could do tell the story better uh, doing a more modern format having it on something like a Netflix or Amazon or HBO or something like that rather than the traditional uh, network television uh, which I think it would have been uh, much better suited for. Uh, so that's what I'm looking at in my version of the reboot of Lost. So um, I'm going to keep the same length of seasons. So Lost had six seasons, so I'm keeping six seasons. So every uh, every uh, couple months when I cover uh, this uh, season of Lost with my reviews, at the end I will do my version of how I would write that season. Uh, but the main difference I'm going to do, particularly for the first three seasons of Lost, is I want to shorten the season, that they should be shorter seasons. Kind of the opposite of what I did with how I would write Game of Thrones, where I, season seven, where I actually made that longer. With Lost, particularly the first three seasons, I'm going to make them shorter. Uh, actually, pretty much with season one, I'm splitting it in half. Because there were 25 episodes in season one. My version is going to be 13 episodes per season. So all six seasons of my version, all of them, no matter how long or short they were originally, are going to have 13 episodes. So it's 13 episode seasons, kind of like Breaking Bad or The Expanse or some other shows do that. It's, I think, a good number. Because I think it was a big issue, particularly with the first couple seasons with Lost, is that there was a lot of filler. And the story did drag out too long, and this frustrated a lot of people. And particularly when we get into like stuff like season three, they ran out of backstories, and they were doing like flashbacks just so just so they could do them uh, because they went through the story too quickly. Uh, because, well, they took because there were too many episodes per season, and so they were having to invent like a lot of filler and stuff for people to do. Where my version or reboot, as I see it, should be a lot more concise the way that a lot of modern television uh, shows are. So, one of the first main changes I'm going to make to it in my version of Lost 
as uh, the cast of characters. So, um, basically, I'm going to say what our main characters and supporting characters. Now, the distinction I make from that is not like, say, when I say supporting characters, I'm not talking about Sun or Jen or Claire uh, or uh, like Charlie or Boone. Uh, for me, those are all main characters. When I say supporting character, I'm talking about someone like Arts or uh, <laughs> or, um, China, or Rose is another example. In fact, those I think were the only two examples in season one uh, is like Arts and Rose. That's what I mean by supporting characters. Uh, so I'm changing it up a bit of who main characters and I'm adding a lot more supporting characters. Although, like the main difference I'm going to make is in the show I believe there were like 48 survivors like once after the, the initial crash cleared and you know people died from the injuries or blown up in the engine or whatever uh, the, I think the number they gave for survivors was 48 my version number is going to be 35 so that's going to cut back on having too many background characters uh, around and stuff like that also another very important distinction in my version, is there's just going to be no such thing as a background character. In the show, they had things called socks, or characters called socks, who were basically the extras, the background characters who would float in and out and be just not be important, and we'd just focus on our main characters, and every once in a while you get a supporting character like Rose or Arts just pop up out of nowhere. Uh, that's not going to be the case. And in, in my reboot version, they're going to hire the exact same actors. They're going to have 35 characters. They're going to know exactly who they are, who each and every character is. There is going to be no socks. However, that being said, not all the characters will be main characters or even supporting characters. Some of them will just be extras in the background, but you are going to contract these extras. You're going to actually hire actors if you need to, like amateur actors who uh, aren't that picky. And you're going to contract them to force them to be in the show for however long as necessary, all six seasons if need be, and um, force them to be in every episode. So it's not floating in and out. You're not changing. You're not just having generic extras. You're having the same exact extras so you, the audience will recognize them and, and knows that there is indeed a very clear cemented 35 survivors of this plane crash, if if you know what I'm saying. Uh, so, so uh, basically, so let me go through the list of characters I have. So the list of main characters are basically the same with a few exceptions. Uh, so my list of main characters are Jack, Kate, Sawyer, uh, Locke, Saeed, Sun, Jen, Michael, Walt, Hurley, Charlie, and Claire. Uh, and my list of Supporting characters. This is characters who are basically, they may not have a line of dialogue. Every once in a while they pop up and they have them in the line of dialogue. Something like Arch. But the difference in my version is Arch just pops up at the end of the season. My version, Arch's going to be there from the very first episode. You can see all these supporting characters from the very first episode, but they may not have dialogue. They may or may not have dialogue. They may just be in the background, but then another episode down the line, they'll have dialogue. So my list of supporting characters are Boone, Shannon, Rose, Arts, Ethan, Joanna, Neil, a.k.a. Frogert, Scott, Steve, Tracy. <laughs> so you might think, whoa, that's a lot of supporting characters. But bear in mind, as I said, like most episodes, they won't even have dialogue. And in this case, is if this is an issue in practical terms, I say hire again, hire actors who are just beginning, who are just starting, who are willing to take on work as an extra for some episodes, but actually get paid for full cast member from other episodes when they do have a line of dialogue, or just do their contract in a way uh, that makes it affordable for the show to have such a large cast, because I know <laughs> that was an issue with this show. But large casts are coming more and more common in um, more modern shows, back more so than back when they were in the 2000s when this show came out. But anyway, like as I said, like... Treat, they can even treat them as extras for certain shows, but they'll always be there 
in the background. Maybe not necessarily. Like Rose not appear, may not appear in every single episode, but you will see a shuffling of these supporting characters in the background to, to tell that they're there, to have some continuity to it. And they won't always speak, uh, but sometimes they will. Uh, so, <laughs> main thing you might be able to tell, Boone and Shannon were reduced to supporting characters in my version, and absolutely so, because these two characters were useless. I think they were probably the biggest uh, low point of season one that really held season one back. Uh, um, and I, so I wasn't going to take them out entirely, just reduce the amount of time you see them. Because especially in the earlier episodes, you get all these scenes with them just whining at each other. Blah, 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 and it's just so unnecessary. However, they do serve some narrative purpose for being there. And having them there is not totally a bad thing. But just have them pop up every once in a while, every once in a blue moon, not be treated as main characters as they were in the show. Now, Rose, of course, she was a supporting character in the show as well, although we only see her in, like, the pilot and then one other, or a couple other episodes in season one. As I said, my supporting characters will be seen in the background constantly through the season, so that's the difference with Rose. And again, Art, as I said, he just popped up at the end of the season. Here, he's not going to pop up at the end of the season. Well, we actually, some of these scenes we got with him in the, ex uh, in the episode Expose, where he's like, Boone stole the water. Like, we'll see stuff like that throughout the season, where he's around, but not a major component. He's just there in the background. Ethan. Now, this is very important, and there's a big asterisk next to Ethan, of course, obviously. But this is very important, that we see Ethan from the very beginning, from the very first episode. Therefore, when it's revealed that he is one of the others, it's a much has much bigger impact. It wasn't. I know in the show they showed him like briefly in the previous episode, which, oh, yeah, one episode, whatever. No, the entire time. Uh, you see Ethan, and again, he's like a sporting character, so sometimes he has lines of dialogue, sometimes he doesn't. Now, Joanna, uh, you might be like, well, you made up this character. No, I didn't. Now, I'll tell you what, I didn't make up the names of any of these characters. All these characters were at least mentioned in the main show. Now, Joanna, you might be like, who the hell is that? I will refresh your memory <laughs> later in this video when I go through the episodes. Neil, a.k.a. Frogert, of course, he wasn't introduced in the show until season two. He was just mentioned, and then he wasn't actually shown until, like, the webisodes, and then he was in the, <laughs> he was in the show proper in season five. Um, we'll have him from the very beginning. Keep it consistent. Neil was a bit of an annoying uh, guy who goes, Ooh, I'm so awesome. So <laughs> I think he can replace a lot of the, the Shannon and Boone stuff. And not all of it, as I said, because Shannon and Boone are still there. But sometimes you shake things up again. Not always have Shannon being annoying. Sometimes you'll have Frogert show up and be annoying. So <laughs> he, he just shows up occasionally. Scott and Steve, of course, they're, this is the running gag of season one where people always get them confused and be like, oh, you're Scott, you're Steve, but we never actually see them. My version, we see them, we get to know these characters, and I think that, that will bring a bigger <laughs> um, a thing and make the gag even funnier uh, because people get Scott and Steve mixed up, but we actually know who they are, So, but yet yeah, people still get them mixed up anyway, and we, of course, we'll meet them and see, like, They'll get a bit pissed off, but <laughs> why? Why do people constantly get us mixed up? And uh, so Scott, I think he's going to be a character. Is going to be kind of he's going to take the place of Boone's storyline in regards of like being a lifeguard uh, towards the beginning and helping Jack. Like instead of having Boone, we'll have Scott do that. And Steve, he's going to be kind of more of like the nerdy type. Now, the last supporting character I have is Tracy. You may, may be like, who in the hell is Tracy? Well, it was mentioned in a line of dialogue at the very at the Exodus in the finale where Sawyer is reading people's letters and he found out that Tracy was actually hooking up with Steve even though uh, Tracy, he found out in the letter that Tracy was married. So I'm going to include her in a bit and have her hook up with Steve and then we'll get a bit about uh, how she's married. Now here's the thing. You might be thinking, Mark, what the hell? The, the cast of Lost is so huge. Why are you going to take up so much time to develop all these characters? And the answer to that is I'm not. 
I'm not going to develop these supporting characters. The main focus, the, all the character development is going to go into those 12 characters, those main characters I named at the start of the show. These supporting characters will never be in a scene on their own. They only appear every once in a while in a scene with the main characters in order to develop their characters. Like, we'll get a little bit of a sense on who these supporting characters are. We'll, like, we'll know that Boone and Shannon are rich and stuck up. Uh, I'll know that, uh, you know, that Scott is, uh, used to be a lifeguard and that Arch used to be a teacher and stuff like that. We'll basically know much about Arch. He'll be developed just as much as he was in the actual show. So that is to say, not much at all. So all the character development is going to go to the 12 main characters. These supporting characters will just be there for consistency and to show make, because the way the show is now and they actually made fun of this with Arch at the end of the season, is that it seems like these main characters only interacted with other main characters and everyone else was just there in the background and they ignored all the other characters and uh, so they got all the good food and all the good fish and they went on all the adventures while all the background socks just stood there and be idiots that's what I'm changing <laughs> you'll have more interactions with a consistent background character so you so it doesn't feel like they're just ignoring everyone else or being a click as Arts puts it, uh, we'll, we'll change it up a, get, a bit and just have these other faceless characters have some freaking dialogue every once in a while. Uh, but, the, as, but the main focus is going to be on the 12 main characters. It'll just be more consistent. Now, there are... So that brings up 22 uh, characters. So I do have a list of 13 other characters, but these characters, I won't bother naming them because even though I have it written down for my own purposes, but if I just spot out a list of names, it's just a random list of names. Because these characters will not have any lines of dialogues, they will just be background extras. But they will be consistent. It will be the same ones. They'll keep the same actors the entire time. So you see the same faces, so that it has that feeling of consistency. And when someone dies, I mean, you may not know them by name, but you will know, like, basically who they are. So it's not going to be no faces socks in my version. I think that was a horrible idea, but there will be 35 survivors, 12 of them you focus on. Uh, and another uh, 10 that will just pop up every once in a while and maybe have a dialogue or two. And then the other 13 will be consistent. They won't have any dialogue or anything to do, but they will be consistent. Anyway, <laughs> so that's a major change I'm making that will affect season one, but it will affect the show overall. Uh, so let me now get into each episode of season one, the 13 episodes. I have 13 episodes, so let me plot out the episodes for you. What are my 13 episodes? Well, we start with episode one and two, which is the pilots part one and two, which will be Moultrie-centric episodes. So these two episodes are actually pretty much, I'm keeping these episodes pretty much exactly the same. I'm only making a few changes here and there. So uh, some, of the, some of the changes I'm making is, first of all, no Shannon and Boone whining to each other's scenes. We, we don't need this. As, as I said, we'll focus, especially in this pilot episodes, we'll focus more on the 12 main characters uh, and maybe have some of these supporting like Shannon and Boone pop up once in a while, but we don't get any scenes of them whining to each other. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, Scott is the one who knows CPR and is assisting Jack during the crash and asked to find a pen or whatever, not Boone. Uh, so, Ethan, now, <laughs> you might be thinking, well, well, what about Ethan? So Ethan obviously is not there during the crash scene because he's not there. He's another. So Ethan actually first appears the next morning after the monster shows up. So, you know, when the monster shakes the trees and the next morning people are like, oh my God, what is that? That's when you first see Ethan. He's like, yeah, what is that? That's weird. Uh, when, of course, he knows full well. He's just pretending. And so this is something that you, people watching the show for the first time wouldn't notice. Like, because they're still getting used to all these characters. But if you people who, like, watch this on repeat viewing can go back, will be able to tell that for the scenes before this, you can pick out all the characters, like, all 34 other characters were shown in some form or another, even if they were just in the background before this scene, but Ethan was never shown 
before the scene and so it will imply in retrospect even though most people won't notice on the first hearing that this is when Ethan first showed up so Jen gives fish to like all the characters as he did but he also gives fish to supporting characters like Arts and Neil and Tracy and Shannon and Boone don't go on the hike uh, to fix the transceiver you know at the end of the episode where they part two where they do the dun 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 dun, dun and they encounter the the polar bear uh, Shannon Boone not there instead it's Joanna and Steve so Joanna and Steve go with Kate uh, Sawyer uh, Saeed uh, I believe that's all, yeah. And Charlie, sorry, yeah. They go up uh, to try to fix the same transceiver. And Joanna is the one who can speak French, not Shannon. And Joanna speaks perfect French. Uh, so she doesn't have to worry about, oh, can I translate this or not? I mean, you might say that takes away some of the tension in the scene, but I don't think so. I think it makes it just as... Uh, just as uh, tension filled, so she's just able to translate it perfectly while Saeed works out that holy shit that's been playing for 16 years. Ah! Anyway, we'll get to my next episode, which is episode 3 Tubra, uh, Tubla Rasa, a uh, Kate centric episode. So in flashbacks, we get a more comprehensive flashback story that combines elements of the flashbacks in Born to Run and Tibble Rasa. Uh, so it begins with Kate being a fugitive, so we don't get to see what she did, just like they did in the show. But it shows her arriving in Iowa and reconnecting with Tom and talking to her mother, and it ends with Tom dying. But it goes through this a lot more quickly. Uh, than it did in the episode Born to Run because it doesn't end with Tom dying. That's sort of in the middle of the episode because then it will go more into how she then, after Tom dies, she goes to Australia and explains that's why she went to Australia because she was so grief uh, ridden over Tom's death. And also it will have a scene earlier with Tom and saying how maybe in the, when they're listening to recording with Tom and Kate were kids where they talk about how they always wanted to go to Australia. So it's something that Tom always wanted to do but could never do. So that's and it will explain why Kate specifically goes to Australia because saying she just goes there to escape the law isn't good enough. Why is she specifically there? Here we get a reason. It's because she did it as sort of a way of uh, honoring Tom. And so the flashbacks further show her meeting Farmer Ray and showing them connect. <laughs> you know, to be fair, in the actual episode to Barossa, we barely get into the Farmer Ray stuff, so we don't even need to change it that much. Although the thing I would change about it is that uh, she actually connects, tells him about um, Tom, and so it connects it to the earlier part of the flashbacks. And so uh, she tells him the sad story, and he feels really bad for her, and they connect, and he makes her feel better. So they have a much closer connection here, uh, which does then make sense why Kate would save his life and why she wants the marshal to give him the reward, is because of that connection he formed by uh, listening and making her feel better about uh, what her story about Tom. So... On the island story, we get a, a story of all the characters learning to connect. Uh, Locke presents himself as a hunter and goes off with Michael, Boone, and Ethan to hunt a boar. So sort of taking elements from the walkabout uh, island story and putting them here. Uh, but of course, having uh, Boone and Ethan instead of Kate. And uh, a good way to sort of introduce Ethan as a hunter because that's what's established later on. So let's establish this from, from the get-go. And so Jack is trying to cure the marshal just like he was in the show. But he starts to have visions of his father, his dead father, here. And Charlie and the others worry, worry about the water supply. So again, taking some elements from other episodes, sort of condensing everything, which is what I think needed to be done, quite frankly. So... Uh, it's not entirely focused on the, um, the Marshall suffering uh, the same way this actual episode is because we'll have all these other elements in there. Uh, but it ends the same way with Sawyer trying to kill him and then Jack having to kill him instead. So then we'll get to episode 4, House of the Rising Sun which is a Sun-centric episode. So Sun's flashbacks occur exactly the same that they did in House of the Rising Sun in this show. Because those flashbacks were great, they were perfect, 
not changing this, keeping this exactly the same. But the island story begins with Joanna drowning in the ocean, getting caught by a riptide. So Jack goes out to save her, but Scott is out trying to save her, so he saves Scott instead. So, this is what I meant by Joanna. Who's Joanna? If you remember, I think this, I believe this happened in the episode of White Rabbit, but I'm condensing it into this episode here, uh, where Jack goes out to save a drowning girl, and he gets boom instead and saves him, and the girl drowns. My version is not just some random girl we don't know. Uh, was Her name was Joanna in the show, but we're actually introducing her uh in the very first episode, and she's going to be the one to translate the French transmission, so we know who she is, uh, although I'm going to kill her off in episode four, so she dies pretty quickly. But again, it's sort of raising the stakes, that it's not just nameless, faceless socks who die, it's actually supporting characters, so people that we actually had dialogue that we know just die, so it, it raises the stakes of the show. And as I said, Scott is taking on the role of being the CPR guy, not Boone, so Scott's the one who uh, tried to save Joanna, but Jack has to save him, and he's all pissed off with Jack, or oh, you should have saved her instead, blah, 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 blah. So then Jack uh, starts seeing his dead father, so he goes off on this chase, uh, but not much time is spent on this. So I am taking some elements from the episode White Rabbit and putting them in here, uh, because that, that we don't need to spend an entire episode on this. We'll just have a few scenes where Jack going off, trying to find his dead father, but he finds the water in the cave instead. So meanwhile, uh, the fight breaks out between Michael and Jen, and Jen being handcuffed. That all plays out the same way, so we're keeping the House of the Rising Sun stuff in there with focusing on uh, Jen and Michael's conflict. Um, however, Jack discovers the caves and returns with a plans to move everyone to the caves, uh, which is integrated into the storyline with Jen. Uh, and Sun reveals to Michael that she speaks English, just like in the show, and Michael lets Jen go, so all that plays out the same. Uh, but it ends with the camp being split. Uh, Sun and Jen go to the caves to get away from Michael. So, episode 5 is Solitary, which is a Saeed-centric episode. Uh, so, in episode 5, uh, we get the Saeed flashbacks. Uh, has there his flashbacks, the same side flashbacks that we got in the episode The Greater Good, that show him dealing with his friend Assad before, you know, who's like a terrorist and working for the CIA before getting on the plane. All of that is, like, is the same, but I'm putting them into this episode solitary. Therefore, Nadia is uh, teased, but not shown in season one. So we don't actually see any Nadia in season one. We just get this mention because Saeed mentions that he's trying to reconnect to her and that's why he's working with the CIA. So it's a good way to sort of ease our way into the story and tease it. Uh, so therefore, in present, uh, in present times, there isn't much talk or focus on Nadia the way there was in the actual episode uh, solitary. Maybe they bring her up once or twice, but not so much of like uh, looking at her picture and all this. And Russo is like, who's Nadia? We don't get as much cut back on that a bit. So in the island storyline, Saeed goes off on his own to search for the transmission, but there's no guilt involved because he never tortured anyone or anything like that, bypassing that. But he just doesn't want to put anyone else's life in danger, so refuses to let anyone go with him. Uh, meanwhile, we see people in the cave set up their society. We get more of a division between Jack and Kate because Kate stays on the beach and she uh, is, takes charge of lighting the fire rather than to be Saeed because Saeed's out, you know, searching for Rousseau. And, and we get more like setting up Kate and Sawyer and the kind of relationship that they have and Sawyer being a dick and all that. Uh, Michael begins working on a pipe system that could take water from the caves to the beach. And this, is, I think, is very important, uh, which I'll touch on a bit more shortly. Uh, Saeed, of course, comes across, uh, you know, Daniel Rousseau, who tortures him. And this all plays out pretty much the same way it did in the show. So then we move on to episode six which is The Moth, a Charlie-centric episode. So Charlie's flashback play out exactly as they did in the show, in the episode The Moth. That, they were all great, that was perfect, we'll leave it. Uh, we just won't muddy it with further Charlie flashbacks this season. This will be the only one, uh, as it should have been. 
Uh, the island storyline focuses on the cave-in, and much like it did in the show, and Locke withholds Charlie's drugs, just like the show, makes him ask three times and all that. Uh, but there's no side plot about finding a transmission or whatever. Instead, we get more character interactions with other various characters back at the beach, just, you know, developing a bit more, getting the interaction things going. Uh, Michael is perfecting his pipe system, but he takes a break to help in the cave-in. However, major difference in my version is after the cave-in, the caves are deemed unsaved and everyone prepares to move back to the beach. So, all right. <laughs> so this is something that kind of bothered me. In the show, like towards the end of season one, this is all of a sudden stopped being at the caves. There's no explanation. No explanation on how they were still getting water because they made such a big deal at the start of the season. Like, oh, we can't have any water, so why don't we just move to the caves because that's where all the water is. But then all of a sudden they're just back at the beach for the rest of the show no explanation of how they're getting the water uh, no explanation of why they decided to move from the caves why did jack change his mind so here we're getting a very clear the the cave-in means oh uh, these caves are dangerous they're going to cave in any second that's why we can't live here that's why we need to move and plus as i said uh, michael's pipe system that will explain how they get water now, maybe it's not perfect, maybe it doesn't go all the way to the beach, but at least goes closer to make it more acceptable of explain why, where they're getting all this water from, and how come they're still living on the beach if it was so important to get water. You have the pipe system that will explain that, and also uh, explain that they can't live there anymore because it's too dangerous. Anyway, we'll get in then to my episode 7, Raised by Another, a Claire-centric episode. So Claire's flashbacks again are exactly the same as they were in the show. These were perfect. These were beautiful. No reason to change them. Island storyline. Everyone prepares to move back to the beach, but they need time to establish Michael's water transport system a bit more. Uh, and at night, Claire's attacked and Jack doesn't believe her, so she wants to return to the beach ahead of schedule before everyone else does. And Charlie chases after her, and that's when Ethan finds them and snatches them. So Hurley doing the census, that's the same. Again, it's a bit more, and we can see his interactions with some of the supporting characters here as well, and it's a bit more sort of powerful because when he goes to Ethan and he's acting all weird because we already know who Ethan is, and it's again more powerful when Ethan shows up to abduct Claire and Charlie because we'd seen him since the very first episode. Uh, so Saeed returning and saying that they're not alone, uh, that, that revelation and the revelation that Ethan was the plane, you know, Hurley getting up. He wasn't on the plane. That's all the same. That was perfect. Keeping that. Uh, we also get a few extra side plots, like seeing Tracy and Steve are becoming romantically involved. As I said, that's sort of mentioned, and we're actually going to see a bit of that. Just a little bit, you know, on some side plots. Uh, as I said, not take too much time focusing on that sort of thing. So, move on to episode 8, which is special, a Michael and Walt-centric episode. So, Michael and Walt's flashbacks play out exactly the same. Again, these, these were perfect. No reason to change them. However, Island's storyline, totally different. So, Jack, Kate, Locke, and Boone go to search for Ethan. And uh, this storyline plays out uh, same, pretty much the way it did in All the Best Cowboys Have Daddy Issues, except not as much focus is placed on it. Uh, but it ends the same with Charlie hanging from a tree and Jack saving them. So you might think, well, it's weird to you're going to have an episode about Michael Malton. Yeah, it's going to be about Jack and Locke going to chase after them. But as I said, we're not going to. That's not going to be the entire focus. It's going to be something that's reoccurring that we see. But we don't need to spend as much time with Jack and Kate like telling stories and the backstories or whatever. We just see them go off and maybe get the scene where they split up. And uh, definitely get the scene where Locke and Boone discover the hatch, uh, but and then but then go straight to you know Jack's encounter with Ethan and finding it. so just not spending as much time with this. So the main uh, stress of the episode will be focused on Michael because he's left to leave everyone from the caves back to the beach uh, while putting final touches on his water system and giving them a little time to. And so that gives him very little time to look after Walt because he's very busy. So Walt gets pissed at him. 
And so, uh, with Hurley and Tracy's help, he tries to lead everyone back to the beach because all the main players are out of the picture here. So Michael pretty much takes charge uh, in leading everyone back to the beach. But Arts is being a dick and distracting him again, playing Arts a bit <laughs> in the earlier part of the season. Uh, and he's being a bit of a hindrance. So by the time they get back, they realize that Walt isn't there with them anymore, uh, that he ran off. And with Jack, Locke, and Kate off looking for Charlie and Claire and Saeed injured, all the best trackers are gone. So Michael, with Hurley's help, bribes Sawyer to help him go out and look after Walt. So they go out to find Walt. However, they don't have any luck finding him until Jen shows up and he helps and he's able to find Walt. And thus Michael and Jen begin to forgive each other and move past the grievances that they have. Uh, with each other because I'm sort of bypassing that whole burning raft storyline because that was a waste of time. So anyway, they find Walt a sulking and alone, but he is not, repeat, not being hunted by a polar bear. That was dumb. We were leaving that whole thing out. Uh, so, but they convince Walt to return to camp and we get the scene of Michael and Walt reconnecting where he brings up the letter so it ties it to the flashback of the scene. And then Michael comes up with the idea to build a raft. Uh, saying that now they're all back to camp and they got the water he's like this isn't he does the same thing he does in the show where he's just like look we we have this water system we're digging in we're treating this like we're gonna be here forever that's bullshit we need to leave i think his reconnecting with walt just re-emphasizes that uh so that sort of is the end where uh jack comes back with charlie at this you know sort of the same time sort of intermeshing those two episodes anyway Get into my episode 9, which is Numbers, a Hurley-centric episode. So Hurley's flashbacks play out exactly as they did in the show again, yet again. These flashbacks are great. No reason to change them. Uh, the island storyline, Saeed comes to, and like he finally gets out of it, and he wants to examine the papers that he got from Rousseau, but they're all in French, and with Joanna dead... There's no one to interpret them for him. So Steve tries to help as he knows a little bit of French, but he isn't too helpful. So there's no romance coming out of this like <laughs> it was with Saeed and, and Shannon. So it's just we get a few funny scenes with Steve being, you know, a bit of a, you know, not very helpful and Saeed gets a bit frustrated. So that's when Hurley comes in and finds... Uh, the papers with the numbers on it, and Michael begins construction on the raft with, with Jen's help, and they begin to bond more. Uh, Hurley runs off just as he did in the show to get a battery for uh, the raft uh, from Rousseau. However, Charlie isn't involved in the storyline as he's still recovering from his abduction, abduction, and we get the same story with the Rose uh, comforting him. Instead, Neil, a.k.a. Frogert, is the one who goes off with Jack and Saeed to get Hurley. And he's the one who's being a dick to Hurley the whole time, saying that he's running off like Colonel Kurtz or whatever. So we also get a side plot with Jack and Boone uh, digging up the hatch. And, uh, you know, this sort of establishes the hatch a bit more and Locke is unsuccessfully trying to open it. And in the end, Claire shows up while uh, to Locke and Boone while they're trying to undig the hatch. And uh, she's all drugged and confused, and they return to camp with her. Also, during the events of this episode, Kate will stumble across the fact that Sun, uh, Sun can speak English, and she will accidentally let this come out to everyone. And so Jen will find out, and they will be really pissed off and decide to leave her. Again, I'm bypassing this whole burning the raft crap because it was a waste of time. So the rest of the island storyline goes pretty much the same as it did with Hurley, with him confronting Rousseau about the numbers, finding a resolution, and at the very end, the numbers are revealed to be on the hatch. Dun, dun, dun. Like, that's all good. So, next we'll get into episode 10, which is the Homecoming, a Sawyer-centric episode. Ooh. So, Sawyer's flashbacks reveal the letter which he had been shown. It's been shown throughout the show that he's looking at this letter and what it says about dear Mr. Sawyer or whatever. But here in the flashback, it's revealed that it was actually him who wrote the letter when he was a child about his father murdering uh, his mother and then committing suicide while he watched. So we'll see this all in flashbacks in the, in the moth style 
where it rapidly, you know, like the episode The Moth with Charlie's flashbacks, it rapidly goes through his life, starting with the murder, then showing him in his young 20s learning to con people. So rather than getting exposition of him saying, I learned to con, we actually see a bit of that in like a quick scene. And then so the flashbacks will jump in time, and then it shows him as an expert con man pulling off a con job with Hibbs, a.k.a. Robert Patrick, who betrays him. And then later... Uh, the flashbacks will jump further in time where Hibbs is trying to make good on Sawyer by leading him to the real Sawyer that conned his parents. And uh, so Sawyer goes to Australia to kill him. Uh, so it's kind of a truncated version of the flashbacks in Outlaws, but it will only get like one or two jumps towards the end of the episode. So it'll be, as I said, the whole thing is going to be a comprehensive series of flashbacks like The Maw or special that jumps through times uh, but it tells the story of Sawyer going uh, for uh, you know trying to kill the man who uh, conned the con artist who killed his parents well it first starts about the uh, learning to con just like the con man so he becomes Sawyer or whatever and then it shows him being an expert con man and then it shows him going to Australia to kill the man so the, ho the whole theme of the flashbacks here will be the focus on Sawyer's need for revenge and what it did to him in the island storyline, this will be juxtaposed uh, with uh, Ethan returning and threatening to kill everyone. In my version, Jack and Kate never found a case of guns. Uh, that, the, like, whatever the case may be, you notice that episode's not in my version. So that never happened. So Sawyer actually had this case of guns all along. So when Ethan returns, Jack and Locke try to get the guns from Sawyer, who doesn't budge and is being a total dick about it, even when Kate tries to butter him up. It's only until Charlie comes to Sawyer and expresses his needs for revenge that Sawyer relates to him has his own need for revenge is what ties and this is what ties to his backstory so Sawyer agrees to give Jack and Locke the guns as long as he gets to keep one of them for himself of course so Ethan threatening them all and Ethan kills Scott just as he did in the show that all goes down the same so that's another supporting character of mine now gone <laughs> uh, except more people uh, yeah more people know you know, like people know Scott better in this version yeah so we also get some scenes of Charlie reconnecting with Claire and wanting to protect her. However, that's not going to be the main focus of the episode. Like the Charlie flashbacks in the actual show were a waste of time. So we're not wasting our time with that. So we're seeing it from Sawyer's perspective. So in the end, uh, they corner Ethan and Charlie shoots Ethan. But rather than Charlie simply picking up a gun that Jack just so happened to drop uh, when they had uh, Ethan cornered, to everyone's surprise... Sawyer hands Charlie his gun, and Charlie kills Ethan. So everyone's shocked at Sawyer. Why would you do this? But the flashbacks then explain how important his need for revenge is, and he sort of gets a vicarious fulfillment out of seeing Charlie fulfill his need for revenge, uh, if that makes any sense. So this further alienates Sawyer from Jack, uh, but the guns are already out there with Jack and Locke, so they keep them now. Uh, anyway... So, moving on uh, to my episode 11, Deus Ex Machina, a Locke-centric episode. So the flashbacks are pretty much the same as they were in the episode Walkabout, that imply Locke is a badass, and this time we would have had all season to think Locke of this badass hunter, and then finally we get these flashbacks that reveal that he was actually pathetic at working on a box company at a dead-end job being treated like shit, and at the very end of the episode, it will reveal that he was paralyzed and in a wheelchair. So the storyline about his father, that will be pushed back for future seasons. Uh, the island storyline will go pretty much the way it did in the show with Locke receiving uh, the vision about the beach plane and then him going there with Boone and Boone falling for a minute while he's trying to radio from hell. Except that Locke won't tell Boone about being paralyzed at that info wouldn't have been given to the audience yet. So when Locke starts to lose the use of his legs, it will be just as confusing to the audience as it is to Boone until the big reveal of Locke at the walkabout center uh, that he's in a wheelchair, which will be intercut with Locke banging on the hatch 
after Boone falls. Uh, so the side plot with Sawyer needing glasses will be the same as it helps establish like the building of the raft and will take on new meaning after Sawyer just helped to kill Ethan in the previous episode. And so it'll be about him reintegrating into the group and sort of Kate and Jack getting their own sort of revenge on him. <laughs> and we'll also get some scenes of Charlie and Claire reconnecting for their, thing, uh, their romance. So my episode 12 is Do No Harm, a Jack-centric episode. So Jack's flashbacks are kind of again in the style of The Moth, where it's a comprehensive telling of his relationship with his father. It starts with his father being a dick to him in childhood, then jumping to the storyline of his father botching a surgery uh, because he was drinking and Jack having to call him out on that, uh, which ruins his career, to Jack just going to Australia to find him and find out that he's dead. Um, so, I know some people may be thinking, well, you had Jack chasing after his dead father all the way back in, like, episode four, and why are we just introducing him now? But I think that will, that will create the air of mystery. That will be another mystery. People are like, what's the deal with Jack seeing his dead father? And so we'll wait till the end of the season to actually get the backstory of what his, his relationship to his father was. Also, I think it's, I think it would have worked better doing a comprehensive backstory of his father because when we got the episode of White Rabbit and we found Jack uh, seeing his, finding out his father's dead, I found that didn't have the impact. It kind of has an impact if you go watch it on a rewatch because you know the kind of relationship that he has with his father, but before you know it, it's, it, in fact, especially knowing that he, Jack, betrayed his father and that led to his death, I mean, that gives all sort of dynamics, so it kind of takes something away not knowing that when you f see the first flashbacks with him finding his father dead, so I think showing it this way where it shows starts out with him as a child so it shows what a dick his father was but then showing the uh, hospital kind of a truncated version again of all the best cowboy flashbacks where uh, you know he has to out him and he ruins his career and you jump straight from that into flashbacks of the mother saying you have to go to Australia to find him and he goes to Australia and finds out that he's dead. It will be much more emotional, much more impactive a uh, much more comprehensive storyline. And I'm not going to touch on his marriage. I'm leaving that to uh, to future seasons. Uh, this episode is just going to focus on his father. So, uh, in the island storyline, it's similar to the show uh, of Do No Harm, except they're at the beach, they're not at the caves, because no one lives at the caves anymore in this version. And Jack uh, tries to save uh, Boone's life with Son's assistant, and instead of having to send Kate to the beach to get Sawyer's liquor, he has to send Kate to the caves to get more water. Uh, we similarly get the story of Claire giving birth in the middle of the jungle, where Kate finds her, and then Jen and Charlie come to help, and Jack refuses to leave Boone's side. So the difference is there's no stupid romance between Saeed and Shannon and, and like there was in the show. So Shannon is right by her brother's side the whole time. And actually she kind of gets in the way. So Tracy has to sort of help hold her back and preoccupy her uh, so she's not constantly annoying Jack. So it ends with the lovely uh, life and death montage with Shannon crying over her brother's dead body and then we jump straight into the funeral where Locke shows up and Jack yells at him but it's not anywhere near as overly dramatic as it was in the show. Jack doesn't go on a quest to find Locke or accuse him of murdering Boone or anything like that. We just get a bit of Jack sort of yelling at him a bit uh, but it doesn't like he doesn't charge at him and try to attack him or anything like that. And of course uh, we never get a stupid storyline of Shannon trying to kill Locke. Like that's, uh, that doesn't happen. So then finally, we get into episode 13, my season finale, which will be a two-hour epic episode, Exodus, and it will be Rousseau-centric. Yes, that's right. I am putting a Russo flashback in season one, and frankly, I think it should have been in season one because that's where it's most relevant, most on people's minds, most where it would have had the most shock value, it would have been the most mind-blowing. Also, it has more of an epic feel, like uh, Live Together, Die Alone did with having Desmond's flashback in the finale. It uh, would be a really good treat for audiences who stuck through Season 1. Uh, the flashbacks in the actual Exodus, with everyone boarding the plane, 
let's face it, they were not necessary and they were just there as fan fodder and to recap season one, which in my version, season one's smaller, so you don't need to recap it. So instead, we have Russo flashbacks where you see uh, what you think you'd see. Uh, with the Russo flashback where Danielle and her team arrives at the island after hearing the numbers transmission of numbers they get stranded and they're traveling to the radio tower with their team where they encounter the smoke monster and the monster gets and Montan gets dragged and his arm gets ripped off and the rest of their team all of a sudden start acting weird after the smoke monster turned them evil and uh, so I'm, I'm sort of my and I know in the actual show she implied there was a sickness that was an actual virus but they recon that later in season five and be like no it's a smoke monster turning people evil so in my version they're never going to imply that it was a virus so we're going to know from the very beginning that it was like the monster turning people evil uh, some people might say oh that's jumping the gun a bit but I don't think so Anyway, I think it's more important to get this information now. But anyway, so it goes without saying that a time-traveling djinn will not be in any way involved in this. Like, that was stupid, trying to wreck on Jen in this. It was just such a dumb way to try to tell Rousseau's flash backstory once it was always already written off the show. They took too long to get to the backstory. They should have done it right away, season one finale. Anyway. So this allows for some nice juxtaposition, as you could have Rousseau telling Arts about Montan losing his arm, and shortly after, you'd see Montan losing his arm. You could have the flashbacks where Rousseau's team encountered the monster coincide with Jack and Locke encountering the monster at the same location. And it would then go forward to Rousseau killing Robert, going to the radio tower to set the transmission. You actually see this happen. And then her baby Alex being taken by the mysterious others, whom she never sees, but hears their whispers. And uh, this would uh, not at all feature Ben, for fuck's sake. <laughs> In the first season, she said she never saw who the others were. She just heard whispers. And season five, they had Ben show up and, and talk to her. That's dumb. No, that completely recounts it. No, and here, the version is going to go down exactly as she said it did. It would be more mysterious, more uh, scary, more horror. Like, all of a sudden, she has her baby. She goes out to check on something. All of a sudden, her baby's gone after she hears the whispers. And she maybe sees, like, shadows of in the distance of some people running with so she knows it's human beings but she doesn't see their face doesn't know who they are they're mysterious through the others it's all freaking point anyway on the island the island storyline we get a very similar story of uh, that we got in the show of russo showing up in the camp warning that the others are coming to get them and michael and the others are rushing to launch the raft but maybe we can truncate this a bit not spend too much time or it like as I said, it would be a two-hour episode, not a three-hour part or whatever. So we get Jack, Locke, Kate, Hurley, and Art, and Russo going to the Black Rock uh, to get the dynamite, just like they did in the show. Russo then runs off to kidnap Claire's baby, saying Charlie chase after her, and then Art blows himself up. So that's another one of some supporting characters gone. And Jack and Locke uh, have a philosophical debate, just like they do in the show. And the monster tries to grab Locke, and Jack's still like, "All oh, that's I'm keeping." Uh, and then uh, they go to the hatch and they blow it up with dynamite and Harley protests because the numbers are on it. Uh, so yes, I'd still end without revealing what's in the hatch because frankly I think that's better suited for season two because the way they reveal what was in the hatch in season two was so great, I'm keeping that. But the consolation prize is that you'll get Rousseau's flashbacks, which will be awesome. So I think less people would have complained about not seeing what was in the hatch. Uh, <laughs> and also, of course, you'd still have the others come uh, and abduct Walt uh, from the raft. So pretty much everything else in the show will go down pretty much the same. I'm just going to uh, shorten it a little bit and spice it up with some uh, Rousseau flashbacks. So, at the start of the video when I named all the supporting characters, like, Jesus, Mark, you're having so many characters, it's crazy, but... Alright, so, well, I had ten supporting characters to start with. Boone dies, Arts dies, Ethan dies, Joanna dies, Scott dies, so that's five. So I've cut my supporting characters in half. <laughs> by the end of the season and so uh, and of course the next season they will introduce the tail section survivors so that will sort of uh, add in the other characters but there you go 
Uh, that's that's how and that's how I think you can get away. And I think that would make sense to have more characters before the tell sections and slowly kill them off. And as I say, it gives it more of a Game of Thrones type. Anyone can die, even though these aren't main characters. It's boring characters. They're characters we know by name <coughs> who have had uh, lines of dialogue, so make their deaths a bit more uh, meaningful. Anyway, that is it for how I would write Lost Season 1, uh, so part one of my series. So as I said, I, I will be back uh, periodically to do the later seasons to give a more full picture of how I would do a reboot of Lost. And the changes are going to get progressively uh, bigger as the show goes. So it's a butterfly effect, as they say, uh, because uh, I was really... Season one, I wasn't. I was pretty much okay with. Like, I would just change most of the changes that I made had to do with keeping the same characters and condensing it to shorter episodes, which I think is needed to get rid of the feeling of uh, a lot of people felt dragged and there's too much filler. So that's the main main change I made for season one. But by the time I get to season six, yeah, the, <laughs> the show's going to be almost entirely different show because season six was not good. But that change will come progressively. Anyway. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to check back here when I do further uh, how I would write Lost. And of course, I am uh, every two weeks, I will release a new Lost video. Uh, first doing my review of the season. And once I'm finished with the season, do the part of how I would write it. Uh, so be sure to check out my channel for that. Also check out my channel as I do many more videos on other shows like Game of Thrones, Star Trek, The Expanse, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.